All right, so um, can everyone in the Zoom hear me well? Okay, sounds clear. Okay, sounds good. So let's try this out again. Hmm. Just one second. By the way, these slides are on the website, so if you want to download it, you can go ahead. All right. Let's get started. I think it's all good, all right? Yeah, I can make this bigger though. Hopefully that's fine with you. It's very small. All right, so. None. Yeah, so for, so for some reason, I always see the time being 9.41 on this iPad. I really don't get it, but I think the date is wrong too. But I think everything else is working. So, okay, so um, we'll get started. Okay, so the assignment one is due today, 7 p.m., but you have uh, seven low, no, no penalty late days, so please feel free to use it. And the um, assignment two will be released next Tuesday and due in two weeks after, so it will be April 26th. 
Um, any question, by the way, regarding assignments? So, by the way, because I'm doing the, um, you know, on-site in-person class, it's very difficult for me to look at the chat. So please um, speak up or uh, maybe the TA should help me. And it's really hard for me to read this. Does attendance URL is already posted on chat. Uh, please ask a TA, I don't know. Oh, is it? Oh, okay, yeah, 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 okay, no problem. Yeah. All right, so um, today we're gonna talk about the text generation. So I think um, it, it will be very dense actually. So um, let's try uh, to- Professor, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but fast, I think there's but so Also hopefully every, everyone can follow it. So we're gonna cover the um, text generation, encoder decoder, uh, teacher forcing, beam search, attention mechanism, probably many of you have 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 heard of this, but um, let's get to uh, the uh, roadmap first. So as you see, we have been going through a few formulations already, text classification, token classification, and retrieval. Um, so the last part is text generation here. And as we will see, this means that we will need um, different models to formulate this problem. So up to now, we have been using RNNs only, uh, bare born. And of course, we said that that's not still enough for some applications like MRC, but still um, it's doable. But then now on, we'll need uh, some new model to do the, um, the new task or new formulation, which is text generation. So um, what is text generation? Uh, I think there are a few examples. So one of them is, for instance, um, I think I'm not, I don't have it here, but that's like one example is summarization. But I think it's important for you to first understand, I think, um, for you to understand if every problem needs to be formulated as text generation or not. So summarization is a really good example. So when you're given an article like this, like that, and then you might be asked to summarize on the, the long article into some few sentences. And there are several ways to do that. And one way is, one of the stra most straightforward way is extractive summarization. So in extract summarization, the problem is relatively simple. Um, you need to choose which sentence is important in the, uh, in the, in the summarization Oh, in the news article. So let's say the news article has like 100 sentences, then you need to choose like 10 sentences that can summarize the article well. So it, in that case, then it, it is not really a generation problem, right? It's more of a uh, choosing which sentence belongs to your final summary. So you can think of this as more of a classification per sentence. And then um, you can probably use the, the same model that you used for text classification. Or sometimes you can make it a bit more challenging or useful by making it token classification. In that case, it's not about sentence classification, but you're classifying whether each token belongs to the final summary. So it's either text or uh, token classification if you're doing this extractive way. And now you clearly see why this is called extractive because you're, uh, clear, you're basically extracting some important information from the original news article. But then it is also possible to make this an abstract prob abstractive problem. That means, um, well, it, it's not necessarily coming from the original text, but then you are actually writing your own sentence of the news article. So I think when you're, for instance, to, uh, in an English class, you're often asked to write uh, some abstractive summarization instead of extractive, right? Because if you just do extractive, then probably your uh, teachers or professors will be quite angry. Um, and that's exactly the uh, abstractive summarization. And of course, you can say that abstractive is better than extractive, um, especially for machines, because it's not always working well. But then um, still, it's an interesting problem. And um, you're trying to 
generated text instead of extracted. And I wanted to mention this, especially because when you're doing NLP problems, it is sometimes important to um, decide how you want to formulate it. And the, the really important thing is that it's not always a case that you have to formulate as a generation problem, even if it seems like so. So sometimes it's better to, and it's uh, more straightforward to formulate some problem as an, um, some classification problem. But of course, sometimes it's not possible, right? to formulate as a classification problem. And what is an example? Um, machine translation, right? Why is it um, example? Why is a good example? Because I'm just um, turning on the sound just in case it was muted. Um, so why is a good example? Because in machine translation, it is impossible by definition, probably to make it um, extractive because there are two different languages. So how can you extract um, Korean from English. There is no Korean in English or the other way. So in this case, then we need some new model to really tackle this problem. So this can be a recap, but then um, let's take a look at the comparison between the text classification and the text generation problem in a more of a uh, mathematical way. So remember, remember that text classification is um, we used maximum likelihood estimation. And a simple MLE was very enough, right? With cross entropy, we talk about this, right? This is basically same as the um, NNL. And this works incredibly well. And maybe we need a few possible small modifications. Like, um, I mean, some, we even don't really use these these days, but uh, they were sometimes useful. But then what I was trying to say is that MLE with like cross entropy, super simple, works incredibly well in text classification. But then the, there's a really one critical problem with text generation. If we want to um, formulate the text generation problem mathematically, uh, very informally, then the critical problem is that the, the probability space of text is very large, that it is almost impossible unless this very special circumstance to precisely define the probability distribution of the target text. And well, so, well, that's actually because um, there are so many candidates and when you're defining some probability distribution, you have to actually enumerate all the candidates if you're doing this in the, uh, the simplest way. But then how many candidates are there? There are vocab size of V, which can be easily like uh, tens of thousands and then you have fixed length of T, that means you are actually talking about on the order of um, tens of thousands to the power of like 10 or 20. And that's a very big number. Um, if T is like even like 100, like for some document, then um, that's like, uh, well, it's really big number. I think I maybe, maybe I said this before, if you actually try to count the number of atoms in the universe, it's like only 10 to the power of 100. So I'm saying that the exponentiation is really, really making the number big. It's even not possible to really um, count in any way. So, um, so, so it's basically infinite, right? I mean, like, yes, it's finite. It's not infinite probably, right? But then it's basically not countable in, um, in our world. So, oh yeah. I've seen, I've seen some people use like classification to try to use later. Which to predict like the next later mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, That's actually a good uh, point. So what you're saying is you're trying to basically formulate classification problem as a generation problem. So um, that's a very recent extra effort. Um, so uh, it has been uh, more the other way uh, historically. So because classification is easier, it has been easier. So people were trying to make um, some generation problem into classification problem, like summarization. And that's good because classification usually requires much less data to train, or and also it's much easier to train. But then now these days, what people are interested in is that they want to create just one model that can do everything. It's like a one model to rule them all, right? And then if that you want, that's what you want to do, then um, you want to just create one generation model and then ask it to do anything like classification. So I think maybe you saw like some uh, recent models like T0 that basically tries to um, 
you know, formulate the tech classification problem into a generation problem. Um, if it's like yes or no problem, then it tries to generate yes or no, right? Yeah, we, we're gonna go get to that probably not too much, but then toward, towards the end of the class. Uh, that actually was only possible after the pretty language models and large language models. But right now we are actually still in 2015, 2014. So yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, it's very hard for me to breathe. So I think it's it's it would be very highly preferred if you speak up in general, because it's very hard for me to read this. Like, um, maybe uh, okay. Um, so the question is, um, while doing assignment, I came across this confusion: how backpropagation work in RNN as we are using same weight for each word of sentence. I understand the forward path, but while doing backprop, how does it work? Does it um, like update weight um, n times if let's say the length of the sentence is n? Okay, no, the update only happens once. So you have to think of, so you can think of RNA more of a using the same weight, say, uh, the same weight multiple times instead of updating multiple times. So if you use the same weight multiple times, then your function will be, well, quite complicated, right? But then still at the end, it boils down, boils down to, uh, boils down to the, um, just one update, one gradient. It's just that the, uh, you're using the same weight multiple times. Does that answer your question? So the yeah. Return, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's, oh, if you have a question also, please feel free to come to my office hour um, or TAs. All right, so um, let's come back to the text generation. So that's why um, in text generation, the first thing we do is that we define the probability distribution in a more of a conditional manner. So what that means is that you, in uh, um, so basically, instead of uh, formulating the this probability directly, which can be very difficult, right? So what we do is that we want to, uh, let's say that we y, y is uh, y1, y2, up to y t. Then the way that we formulate this to make this more, um, I would say, uh, yeah, it's um, it's to make this uh, not um, it, to make this uh, to handle this basically. We first define what's the probability of the y one given x, and then we define what's the probability of y two given x and y one, and we just do that. And then this is like a strict equality because this is a bias rule, right? So it's not like approximation; it's actually exactly equal to each other. So then problem is then, okay, now we decompose the original distribution into these um, multiple or T distributions where each distribution corresponds to uh, the generation of one word. Then now the next question is naturally, how can you define uh, each probability distribution? Because that's, that's the, the first way, the place where we start, right? We want to define the probability distribution with some neural networks. So first, actually, first word is quite straightforward, right? This is basically just V-way classification because <coughs> V is the number of, of, of words in the vocab. Then we just want to, um, well, do V-way classification. If this was a uh, RNN or I mean, if, it doesn't, if, if you're using the same network that we have been using, then it's going to be something like, for instance, we have this some um, RNN, um, well, to be more exact, let's say this is a, you know, X, and then we can just use this last hidden state, for instance, and then we make this into uh, V-way logits, and then do softmax on top of that to make um, the next word classification, right? It's very straightforward. So it's, that's like one of the simplest approach. I think it's, there's no difference between this and the text classification you did for the assignment one. It gets more complicated when um, t equal two. So we can still use the same 
this vision But then how about the uh, py2 given x and y1? Um, so we can still do the same thing, right? We can maybe try to um, create the, another layer for the second probability distribution. But then now the, the also one of the issues that we want that to be dependent on the, the output of the first layer, because, um, well, we, need, we have this, right? And of course, we're going to continue doing this. So we cannot just add new layers one after another because we don't know how many uh, words we're going to generate. So it's not we don't want to have uh, one layer for each output. So we want to this to be um, we want to make this generic, right? Not just a special case for one or two tokens. So we need now some sort of uh, more of an inductive def definition to make this work. And well, just Talking about the history first, so um, we're talking about neural nets, but then um, let's talk about what ha people have been doing um, really briefly in machine translation. So um, before neural nets, of course, the machine translation was a very important problem. And that's why um, a lot of uh, people were trying to create a uh, empty model. And the, the, um, the standard was to use some phrase alignment to create a model, of course. There's a dictionary that contains, for instance, um, we with this is, I think, woman, right? Like, uh, so there are some alignments between the, um, the for instance, Chinese phrases and English um, word or phrases. Um, and then using that, they were trying to create a mathematical or probabilistic model that can um, have a good alignment between the target sentence and the original sentence or source sentence. Uh, I'm not going to go this into too much detail because, um, well, I, no one's really using this anymore. So I don't think it's, um, at, at, le at least at this point of uh, time in your, I think, study, it's not uh, super effective. Maybe later, if you're interested in history, then maybe it's good to learn about them. But anyways, there were a phrase level machine translation. They were direct defining a lot of dictionaries. The important thing I wanted to talk about is that when they were trying to create machine translation back then, um, they were uh, basically writing a lot of codes, um, a lot of rules, like uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, lines of code, and then um, a lot of dictionary. It's very complicated, like a team of like uh, 10 to 50 people were working on one system to make this work. And it was very difficult to update too. And, and even then, I think if you remember like, uh, like 2016 or before that, I think even 2017, if you're using like Google Translate or like Neighbors, Papago, the translation was really bad. Um, and that was because they were using this kind of SMT. And then around like 2017, you were uh, probably realized like at some point it got really good. And now it's like, it's even better than humans sometimes. And that was actually the deep learning. But um, of course, um, you know, these models, uh, NMT coming into these um, actual products took some time. So we're talking about 2014, 2015, when we talk about like uh, the breakthroughs in um, uh, NMT, but then when the, the time that, that those things got into the actual products were like one or two years later. So uh, really the, the, I think uh, the, the key work that, basically open the, um, the age of neural machine translation instead of statistical machine translation. And also I think open the, uh, the possibility of deep learning in NLP it was this paper in 2014. So I think it's a really important paper that uh, you want to know is um, basically it's an encoder decoder. Um, so maybe these days, if you have heard of or have done some NLP, then this is maybe so obvious that uh, why people have, couldn't think about this before. But then, um, yes, uh, people couldn't think about this before. So, um, so uh, it is it was a uh, first time that they, that the uh, some sort of a model in neural networks can generate text, not just classif classify. So, what is this? So, actually, it's basically. Um, exactly answering the question we had um, a few slides ago. How can we make the text generation generic? 
um, not just uh, one or two words. So in fact, it's actually quite straightforward on the um, encoder side. So encoder decoder is a combination of uh, encoder and decoder apparently, right? And there is a encoder which takes the um, input and there's a decoder, which is the creating the output. So actually encoder side is very straightforward. It's exactly the same as what you did for the um, um, assignment one. Um, you basically just use an RNN to encode it. Okay. And, but one thing important here is that at the end, we want to create a single vector that contains the entire information of the input sentence. So that's basically C. And there are several ways to find this. In the uh, Troy et al. 2014, they defined this to be the last hidden state of the uh, RNN. So I think in your assignment, maybe you were using some um, pooling, like mean pooling, max pooling, because I told you that that's better. Um, back then, they didn't know that. So they just used the last hidden state. Or sometimes um, they were doing pooling. Um, but then um, it's mathematically more, you know, it's, uh, I think, more elegant to use last hidden state. But in practice, this, this doesn't work well. But anyways, let's say that this C is containing the entire information of the input. Then here's the interesting part. We want to use another RNN to generate one token after another. Or in other words, we want to classify um, one token after another. So we want to just basically define that the conditional probability for each step in the output RNN or decoder RNN. And also they were using something called GRU instead of LSTM. I'm not gonna go into details, but um, we can see what the difference is. It's actually quite similar though. But then let's go more of a mathematical stuff. So I think uh, getting the C is quite straightforward, right? But then I think the, the more of a uh, non-obvious um, part is the how we can create one word after another on the decoder side once we have obtained C. And this C is here, right? And how we want to create that is that we first want to define a recurrent neural network on the decoder side. So this is very familiar, right? HT is function of HT minus one and YT minus one. It's very familiar. It's exactly the RNN definition where of course a YT minus one is not um, the input, but then the word that you generated previously. And that's why it's T minus one instead of T. And then uh, HT minus one is just previous hidden state on the output side. But now another thing is that you have C. So usually what how you do this is that because if you remember how the RNN worked, RNN was uh, something like this, right? Um, for instance, um, plus, plus uh, B, right? But then if you have one more input, C, then you can just create a, another um, WC and multiply that by C, right? So it's a straightforward extension. And then once you have defined this recurrent relationship of HT, then how you define the, this uh, conditional probability, we saw this, right? Remember, but then now remember that now C is replacing X because we assume that the C is actually uh, has the all the information in the X. Then exactly just some function that uses this hidden states and the previous output and C. So we're just saying that the, it's some layer on top of HT. And then of course softmax probably, right? Um, and GRU is actually quite similar to LSTM. It, and the only difference is that it's simpler and um, it uses some fewer gates, fewer computation. But it, I think just uh, as a recap, especially for LSTM, it's worth going through. Um, so, well, what is ZT? ZT is, uh, it's very similar to, um, well, let's see. It's basically a gate. It's kind of input gate or forget gate that we looked into in the LSTM. Um, that's why um, it's saying sigmoid G. So it's a sigmoid. Um, and then RT is also, well, where is it? Gate. So we have a two gates. So in LSTM, we had three gates, right? Input, forget, and output gates. But then in the GRU, we have one on two gates. C 
Z and R, but then how they are defined is exactly the same. And then we have a new hidden state, which is a bit complicated because now we have um, this, um, this R gate applied to the previous hidden state and then um, multiplied to some uh, linear transformation, whereas we have a similar weight transformation with the uh, XT part. And then we have this HD candidate and then we use this and then we use the gate again. But now this gate, now we see a very interesting um, uses of gates. And this is actually more common these days if you're using gates because um, this interesting part of this is that if Z is one, that means you are not using HT minus one at all. If ZT is zero, then you're not using the, the candidate at all. So it's more of a uh, switch, right? But then of course the Z will be somewhere between zero and one, not exactly zero one. So it'll be more of a soft switch, but um, it's more, I think, intuitive than the else, how the LSTM works. But anyways, uh, in, in practice, this is very similar to LSTM or sometimes worse. I think usually a, a bit worse than LSTM, but then, um, and uh, again, after all these days, um, there are very few usage of LSTMs or GRUs. Everything is now kind of replaced by a transformer. But um, decoding is not trivial. So we're still in 2014, but um, still decoding is not trivial because um, training and inference are both tricky for decoder. We just talk about the inference part, but then um, even then inference is not straightforward because of the, um, the, um, the more of a, um, so this is like a really hard search problem. And also training part is even trickier. So that's something that we're gonna uh, take a look before we have a break. Um, so, so first thing is uh, on the uh, training side. So during training, let's think about this. Um, how, can, how should we train this? So we, the, in order to train our model, we, uh, we know that the, the, probabilistic, the probability distribution is defined per token. And then that means then probably the, classifying the first word is straightforward. It's just basically MLE of the first word. But then how about the second word? How would you define that? Technically, if you want to define the probabilistic distribution of the second word, then you have to actually enumerate all possible um, cases of the first word and then define the probability distribution of the second word per each possible case. So it's, maybe it's not too clear here, but then let's see. So this is good, right? This is good. But problem happens here. Why is this problem? Because Y1 we have to, if we want to define this formally, you have to consider every case of Y1 being, um, you know, I, some, some word like, uh, hello, I mean, I don't know, student. There are like a V number of possible candidates for Y1. And then if you want to define this, um, fully, then you have to actually consider all possible candidates of Y1. And that's basically impossible. Anyway, it's still making this problem very difficult. So then what can we do? There are, there are two ways. One is that um, because we know the answer for Y1, we can just insert the, y1, the answer Y1 and then try to predict the next Y2. That's one way. Um, another way is that um, we can compute the argmax of a P of a Y1 given X. So basically it's a prediction that the model has done and then use that for the uh, second probability distribution. So the, the basically if you're using your models output then it's pre previous because basically you're feeding the, the output of the previous output during training time. And teacher forcing is you're always using the, um, the answer instead of um, um, feed previous. So there are uh, two ways. And mathematically, this is a bit complicated, but um, when you're implementing this, it's very quite straightforward. 
um, basically when you are trying to um, do the um, this uh, compute computing this loss p of y to give an x and y one, um, then you're basically just th thinking about what y one you should give this to this to this model, and then um, that y one can be either your model's prediction of the previous time step, or it can be the actual answer. Um, so the that's the basically exactly option one. So we're simulating the inference situation. We feed the prediction as the input for the next word prediction, this feed previous. And we, if we nevertheless feed the ground truth for the next word prediction, this is teacher forcing. Um, teacher forcing is usually preferred. Um, so that's there are several reasons. One reason you can think of this is that, okay, if the model gets wrong in the first time step, then um, it, the model will be very uh, not being trained well in the second time step and third time step. It basically gets worse and worse as you go. So teacher forcing kind of um, prevents the model to get in a very wrong way, even if uh, initially in the early in the training, because it will be very bad, right? That's why it's called teacher forcing. Teacher is kind of forcing your way. Um, but um, so this will be more clear when we're doing the lab session. But to give you a bit more of a, um, um, Context, well, well, first of all, the, how the teacher forcing works, it's quite straightforward because the, you, are, you are trying to give labels is the next word. So it, when you're doing implementation, then you're given why, and then how you train the model is that you basically shift the y to the right by one time, one time step, and then put that as an input. And then you basically try to generate the, um, um, the y and so it's like this, right? Um, you have a start token here, some some special token that goes into the um, the RNNs, and then you try to predict y one, and then y one goes in. Oh, by the way, so this y one is ground truth. This is a prediction. So the prediction y one is not necessarily same as the ground truth y one, and this outputs uh, ground truth y two, and of course the cross entropy is computed between the prediction y one and the actual ground truth. Right. So if you go to up to the last time step, then this becomes y t minus one, and this is uh, predicting y t, and this is compared against actual ground truth y t, and that's why I'm saying that you're shifting the um, the y by one to the right because you see the this y y t would have been here, but then this has been shifted. So again, this avoids us uh, avoids error accumulation in the early stage of training. But then the the, the biggest problem with teacher forcing is that this induces the exposure bias, because the ground truth is never observed during inference, right? Um, so, which means that you're during training, you're always using ground truth. But then, um, which means like teacher is like kind of you know forcing you to uh, go this way. But then, during training. There is no teacher. You have to actually do it yourself. And then teacher was helping you so much at every time step that um, you're like kind of uh, the model is kind of um, uh, expecting some help, but then there is no help. That's you can think of that as exposure bias. Um, so the good thing is that at least the bias does not seem to be severely hurting the performance in 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 general. But then um, there are still some issues when you're trying to optimize this performance to the really the, um, the, the best possible. Then in that case, um, some techniques like reinforcement learning might be useful. Um, yeah, actually, let's see what time this is. Um, it's 9.40, right? Okay, so let's take a, actually, let's just, um, go up to here and then take a five minute break because um, I think it's not a good place to take a break. So um, how can you avoid exposure bias? In fact, we can go back to our original public, public distribution and then try to enumerate all possible outputs and compute the gradient. Then you will avoid exposure bias because that's exactly, um, I mean, the full definition of the gradient. It's a uh, very exact estimation of the gradient. What that means is that um, you basically enumerate all possible um, 
text. So for instance, um, well, there are several possible, not several, but like there are almost infinite number of possible candidates, right? So we talk about this, like uh, we have uh, basically um, something like that, y2 equals something like that. And then we have basically a different configuration um, and this will be, of course, again, uh, V to the power of T configurations. And then for each possible output, uh, we can compute the, um, the loss. And then we try to basically maximize for the answer um, configuration. For instance, if this was answer, then you can try to maximize the probability of this um, compared to other probability distributions. Then in that case, then you're basically creating a truly um, non unbiased model without exposure bias. But of course that's impossible, right? So it is impossible to enumerate all this. So what people usually do is that we want to approximate the gradient of number one with some sampling. So if you want to do this in an unbiased way, then that's where you use like some techniques like policy gradients. Probably you heard of this in the reinforcement learning class. It has no bias, but high variance. So it doesn't really work in practice. There are various R methods like extra critic, they're low bias and low variance. So it's not unbiased, but still low bias, and then it's um, low variance. And there are some, um, again, work trying to do that. We're not gonna cover this a lot because it's if you go into this direction, it's like, oh, that's a whole lot of class. Actually, it's probably your, could be your PhD thesis. So, um, but then in general, what I'm trying to say is that um, in the text generation domain, when you're trying, when you're defining your loss function, it's important to note that the loss function is not unbiased. It is biased, and it's almost impossible to make it unbiased unless you actually use some RL. But then still, it's not a good idea to use just RL because it's guaranteed that it will be very high variance if you make it unbiased. So, bias is not a bad thing if it's not too big. But at the end, it will cause some issues like degeneration, like it's basically some repeating words, for instance. That's because of these kind of uh, problems. Okay, so um, we're gonna take a break, um, five minute break until 9.48, and then come back and go through some beam search and also um, attention mechanism. Although, yeah, I don't think we're having enough time, but yeah, five minute break now. Oh, Professor, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think there is a yellow line in the screen. So is there any way to remove this? Um, I don't know what that is. Huh. That's really weird. I think this is a mon monitor thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't think it's something that I can erase. Oh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just, this is the monitor that has uh, some drawing functionality, and I think it's drawn. Um, we can. And if I move this. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's very weird.
Okay, let's get started. Mm. All right, so we just talked about the um, bias. So the conclusion I wanted to make is that um, when you're training some teacher forcing model, then uh, first of all, there is a bias. And number two is that, um, well, removing the bias is something that people have tried for a long time, but I guess that there is no um, one clear solution. Although there are some effective ones, like for instance, RLs or um, some other ways. But it's not just about the inference, I mean, just about training, but also in inference, you need to be careful mm -hmm. because when you're doing inference, um, you still need to arc, com compute the argmax, right? Uh, it's not about during training that you're, you want to take a look at the probabilistic distribution, but then you also argmax your uh, probabilistic, probabilistic, probabilistic uh, distribution. And that means then basically you have to find a configuration that of, uh, or basically choice of the y, y i token, each y i token, which maximizes the final probability not each conditional probability. And that's the important part because um, if you just do the argmax of the each conditional probability, then that will be just a greedy decoding, right? I mean, it will be non-optimal. And that's why people use some other, some more advanced search mechanisms, or of course you can also think about exhaustive search, which just tries out every configuration and then um, try to see if that's the uh, best but um, again, it's impossible, right? Exhaustive search, this is impossible. Greedy search is exactly maximizing or doing the argmax in each conditional probability distribution. And that's usually not too bad, but then still it's suboptimal, right? Um, well, so the most preferred way generally is using beam search, which is keeping the top K best search results at every time step where the K is the beam size. So this is a really usually a preferred way. And of course, if K equal one, that's exactly same as greedy search, right? So it's kind of similar to, I think when you have, uh, if you have taken some um, undergrad AI class, then maybe you have been doing some sort of a search problem like DFS, BFS. Um, well, it's not exactly the same as those pr problems, but then um, it's kind of similar in, in a sense that um, you want to find the best configuration and you have a kind of uh, reward function in each time step. And then you want to find the, um, you, cannot, you cannot go through every action. So you have to just keep the top 10 um, paths at all time. And of course, the bad thing is that this reward function is uh, no way, um, for instance, uh, define in a way that you can use like a star search or some sort of um, advanced search mechanisms for certain reward functions. So that's why you have to do this of uh, um, uh, beam search because there is no way to do this efficiently. You have to always approximate it or um, you have to take a lot of time like exhaustive search. But there's still one problem. Well, that's actually um, bottleneck problem. So this is exactly the um, well issue with um, using the last hidden state of RNS to do something. I think we talk about this too. Um, we are assuming that we can contain the entire sentences meaning in one vector, but that assumption is well, not necessarily true. And there were some people saying that, well, it's impossible. You cannot really cram the meaning of a whole sentence into a single vector. And it's important to actually think about this in a two ways. One is uh, more of an information theoretical way. And number two is um, in more of a, whether a deep learning model can actually do it in practice. So theoretically, so information theoretically, um, is this statement true? And I will say probably not. I mean, what I'm saying is that you can probably cram the meaning because if you think about the, uh, the size of one vector, if the hidden state size is for instance 128, that means if you're using, um, for instance, um, float value, then float 16 is like two bytes. 
or let's say we're using uh, 432, which is four bytes. Then we're talking about 128 dimension times four bytes, which is, uh, well, 512, right? Bytes uh, or 0.5 um, kilobytes. And how many, how much do each character in English take up space? One byte, right? So this means that this is equivalent to um, 512 characters without any loss. And of course they can even do compression sometimes. So probably you can contain more information. So then 512 characters is apparently, well, probably longer than one sentence in, in many ways. So information theoretically, you can really cram the meaning, but then the problem is that there are several assumptions. One is that can one fold value really contain the four characters? And that's very difficult because, um, well, one fold value is a real number and it's very hard to actually contain so much information uh, because otherwise the uh, you will have to make it very pre precise. Something like, uh, you know, if your value is between zero and uh, one, then this is like certain character, one and two, then certain character, it probably it'll be the, like, that's the, one, the way that it will work. But then that's really difficult for deep learning models to actually um, take advantage of. So in practice, it doesn't really work. So, the problem is that the seed cannot contain the entire information of X. And that means that um, even if we do compression really well, that's really uh, not working well. So the idea that people have been thinking about, uh, so the, this, this tool at all was proposed in 2014. And by 2015, what people were thinking about is, can we directly access the source sentence instead of trying to summarize that into one vector. So that brings us attention mechanism. And this was proposed in 2015. Actually uh, from um, the same institution. So actually, especially back then, that's why I think um, um, Montreal, University of Montreal and Mila were kind of considered as the, um, the, where the deep learning was born, along with, I think other, some people say the fathers of deep learning, because actually these advancements were made. So in, especially NLP was, I think um, a, lot, a lot of them were made in the Mila. Um, I think uh, more of an image part was like, for instance, Jan LeCun or Jeffrey Hinton. But then anyways, um, so the idea in this paper was that, um, well, if you think of C as a summarization of the entire sentence, you, uh, instead of having one static summarization, which is just like uh, that's done after reading the entire input sentence, um, what they're trying to do here is that um, they want to really summarize in a more of a dynamic manner. So we, we want different summarization for each time step in the decoder. So you can think of this in different ways. That's a one way to put it. Another way to put it is that you basically access the token directly. So it's kind of memory access. So I usually think of this in two ways. One is memory access. The other way is the dynamic summarization. So uh, how you actually summarize um, depending on your current status. So if you think, of, look at this um, decoder, if you were doing using the same um, Cho et al. 2014 on this model, then this would have been, well, just one token at the, at, the, at the end, and then this goes in here, right? But then instead of doing that, we have some, we compute weights for each output of the input tokens, and then this weight sum to one, so it's more of a softmax, right? And then we use that for the, that, um, output token generation instead of a one fixed um, vector. And in this case, then if we just control the weights then we can control which token, which token we want to look at each time step. Another way of looking at it is that attention is again, dynamic summarization per decoding step. So um, again, um, access or dynamic summarization. That's the keyword that you can think of this as. 
So some math, but it's not too complicated, actually. Okay. So remember the C? So no, C is no more uh, just C, it has I, right? Why does it have I? Because the C will be dependent on um, each time step. And CI is just the um, weighted sum of the, all the input hidden states. This is, this is the input hidden states. So these are the uh, outputs of the input LSTM or GRU. But these are the scalar weights. And of course, summation of IJ is equal to one. And that can be enforced by, again, using softmax, right? This is softmax. And what goes into softmax, it goes, uh, the uh, logits go into softmax and logits are EIJ. And EIJ can be a function of um, the um, hidden state in each time step of the input and the hidden state of the output side or decoder side, but previous hidden state. So of course this kind of function, usually we use some linear layers with uh, um, activation, right? So it's not too complicated, um, hopefully. Any question though on this equation? Many things will be also more clear in the lab, hopefully. How do we compute the A? So I talk about the uh, linear layer and activation, but then it's a bit different here because if you just do linear layer and activation, um, then the problem is that, well, it will be a vector, right? It's not a scalar value, but then we want a scalar value for each two vectors. So we want to map this to some real number. So how they did is, it's not the only way, and actually it's not used these days, but then how they did was that they, this is familiar, right? This is familiar, just linear layer. These two are linear. This is our activation. But this results in a vector, not a scale value. So what they did is that they created one another weight. This is weight, not uh, input. And then they do dot product between this weight and the whatever they created with this linear transformation. Then that becomes scale value. So this is people like uh, back then called um, attention with addition or something like that. Um, oh, additive attention. Yeah, it's what people call this additive attention because the interaction between SI minus one and HJ or the two inputs of the uh, scoring function is um, they're added, right? There are other ways too, which is we can also define this to be for instance, um, This to be um, something like, and we have uh, some matrix, and then we have a uh, HJ. So in this case, then you're multiplying. So it's multi multiplicative attention here. And um, this was from the, uh, so this is from the, but now at all 2015, and this is from um, Luong et al. I put the links to these papers on the website. So they're quite similar though, except for this. And this really marks the uh, new era of NLP after the attention, so especially. So 2014, 2015, there were two of these breakthroughs and that's also because machine transfer was a really important problem. I think one of the most important problem in NLP in the, especially uh, before I think um, 2015. Now we have more important problems because MT is uh, not of course solved, but then at least it's very close to, um, I think being solved. Um, well, it's still not that good for long documents, but then it's very good for uh, short sentences. Um, and SMT, again, I said that was dominant until 2015. And then was ex extremely complex, but
but now NMT came in and it was fully data driven. And it, the difference was so big that, well, SMT had like hundreds of thousands of codes. NMT is a, a few hundred codes. So it's like a thousand times more, uh, difference in the complexity, for instance. And then it's data driven. You can just put data, more data to improve it. It's very straightforward. And it takes less time to create it. Uh, it's much easier to maintain it. And that's why people were seeing the um, um, NMT winning SMT by 2016. And they were projecting that NMT will be just uh, even better and better after 2016. And actually that was, uh, that came true. So in fact, I'm not sure where this should go, but it should be something like this or something like that. But SMT is basically dead, almost. Um, and in 2016, it was quite clear. It's not just about machine translation, but then now this can be applied everywhere. So actually, um, just to give you a, a few, well, personal context. So I was I actually started my PhD in 2013. And then it was very clear that, um, I mean, in 2013, people were using, for instance, um, SVMs, um, linear regressions, all these uh, features. And my first two papers were no deep learning. They were all SVM or some linear regression. And then when I went to a conference in 2015, still that was the case. Like everyone's like, I mean, they were talking about deep learning a, a bit, but then they were quite skeptical in 2015 conference. I remember like 2015, September, something like that, year in LP. And then a few months later, especially after these machine translation goes into full effect, it was quite clear that neural networks were working in NLP too. And in 2016 conferences, when I went there, there was like about, I think almost like a 60 to 70% of papers were deep learning. And in 2017, like 90%. So I think, I feel kind of lucky that I was in that, um, I think uh, transition phase because it was really very interesting. Every, a lot of things were interesting. And I think it's quite similar to, um, I think when there's some paradigm shift, um, initially people deny it. A lot of people, some people actually adopted really quickly. And then um, at the end, when the paradigm shift is clear to everyone, then just like, you know, very quickly changes the entire field. Um, yep. But we're not done yet though, right? Because um, in 2016, yes, 2015 uh, was clear that the um, attention is working and empty is working, but then, um, we have to also think about the encoder side too, not just the decoder side. We're saying that uh, we're hoping that encoder LSTM networks are enough to actually encode the uh, input. And we're focusing more on the decoder side where, oh, if we summarize that into just one vector, then that's problematic. So we want to actually have a more of a dynamic summarization. But then people are realizing that um, understanding the input side with just the LSTM is not enough they need some sort of, um, um, well, attention on the encoder side too, because if you're talking about really long sentences, then there's some long-term dependency. And then that long-term dependency, well, cannot be handled well by LSTMs. Um, so can we do better, oh, that's like, that was one direction. So we need some attention on the encoder side. And one direction also was that, uh, can we do better than the burnout at all? Um, there are several issues with this. We'll go into this soon, but then uh, one of them is that uh, computing this attention is very complicated. And also number two is that you cannot, we can only attend on one thing, not like multiple things. Whereas you might want to attend on multiple tokens, right? And another also uh, thing was that the RNN was very not uh, friendly to a lot of people because it's basically applying the same network over time. It's sequential, it's not parallelizable. And it's, that was the biggest difference between RNN and CNN. And that's why people were trying CNNs to actually uh, make it work on uh, um, language models or language tests, because if you could use um, CNN, then you can parallelize really easily, but then RNNs were very slow on GPUs. And there's one interesting, um, well, story, story in, the, uh, in Google too. So Google was actually trying to develop the 
um, their own chips starting in probably 2011, 2012, when they saw that the deep learning models can do pretty well on the uh, images. And back then they were not th thinking about other application much probably. They were of course probably thinking this could be big, but then still they were mostly focused on image domain. And that's why they were actually using the, uh, their, their new chips, um, which later became TPUs um, to work on the CNNs and um, simple layers, but then they were not working on the RNNs. Well, I mean, because they, it's not that they didn't want to make it work for RNNs. It was more about their focus was more on the CNN side. And it is probably, um, as far as I know, I was actually intern back then in 2017 at Google. And then it was the clear that they were actually having difficulties uh, to will make it work for RNNs, although they, it was already working for CNNs and um, you know linear layers. So there were a lot of uh, well, um, you know, complaints from NLP researchers because they were using RNNs and why can't we use RNNs uh, for TPU chips? And Google was saying, oh, but then we're gonna shift to TPU chips soon. We're gonna actually not use the NVIDIA GPUs anymore. So um, there was some definitely, um, a shift and then there was uh, some, you know, in that middle, in, in, the, in the middle of that shift then NLP researcher could not use the RNNs. And there was uh, one of the, uh, well, motivations that people were thinking about, how can we do um, sequential modeling without RNNs? At Google, it was, more, it was uh, actually more motivated to actually uh, work towards that. And, that was actually, um, well, that, that's where it led to the development of uh, attention-only models in 2017, and which probably some of you know, uh, it's called Transformer. And I think we're going to uh, stop here, but then we're going to cover this um, in lecture six. We're going to go back, come back to, um, well, not come back, but then we're going to go into Transformer that was um, proposed in, um, 2017 again, and, and and then I think it's probably one of the uh, most um, influential papers in probably um, 2010s in NLP, especially, and not just NLP, actually, it's being applied everywhere. So uh, it'll be very, I think, important lecture for everyone. So I'll see you um, next week. I think we ended the class a bit earlier today. Well, why do I have like three slides of this? Okay, so yeah, so um, that's it. Okay, thanks everyone. We'll, I'll see you in, um, in the lab session. We're gonna do a lot of uh, probably um, coding on lab, uh, in the lab session so that you can understand the attention mechanism. And then um, next lecture will be on Transformer. All right, thanks.